the subject here, which is trying to be everything to everyone, means that you'll be um, nothing to no one. Can I say, guys, um, this is a problem, and I've decided to talk about it because it does lead in really well for social media because you've got to understand how you want to position your business before you talk copiously about it to lots of people. Um, in New Zealand, we have this thing, and I think it's because we're just a small country. Uh, if I can give you a dime for every time when I say to people, so, you know, how are you going to position your company? Who are you going to actually target? Oh, everyone. And I think because we think we come from a country of three and a half, four million, that four million people would be pretty cool. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing none of your businesses could even cope with four million people as customers. And the thing is, the four million people actually probably don't want you to purchase what you want actually offer anyway. So uh, positioning is really, really important because you waste a lot of time and you waste a lot of money because uh, those four million people are quite happy working with companies whose whole offer understands them, is positioned towards them and marketed towards them. So um, let's have a look what that means. So um, before we actually start this, I kind of want to do a little quiz so we understand what the positioning is. So if you've got a pen and paper, fine. If you're not, just hold it in your hand. This is kind of like a real rapid, rapid quiz. Um, you have a knee injury. You've played your favourite sport. You know, so just imagine at the time we're kind of athletic, okay? Uh, you need to get it seen to. A, do you go to your general bone specialist? Or B, you go to a knee specialist. Which would you choose, A or B? Just write it down. Second thing, here's a second part of the quiz. Um, you have a quite significant, serious tax issue. Okay, like it's not just provisional tax, it's kind of end of year crisis thing. You know, Murray, all those things you deal with. Uh, so uh, you have to get some help, okay? So A, uh, you go to your day-to-day -day accountant or bookkeeper, or B, you go to a specialised tax advisor. What is it, A or B? Just quickly write that down. And lastly, and I'm sure this won't apply to many of us in the room, uh, but you have a claim against you for giving dodgy advice to a client. Okay, not a good thing. I'm sure it doesn't apply to anyone. A, do we go to the lawyer uh, that who have recently helped us purchase our new home, or B, do we go to the solicitor who specialises in professional negligence claims? How many of us got all Bs when they did? Ah, got top of the class. Thank God there was no prize. I'd be bankrupt. <laughs> okay, so from the Bs, what did you notice about Bs? What did you notice about when I talked about Bs? But this was supposed to be easy, guys, so it's not a hard... Yep, they were quite focused, they were quite niche, they'd obviously probably had built up quite a big re a reputation maybe, and that is how they had chosen um, to position themselves in the market. Okay, so that was, now that's not the only position that you can take, but that's actually how they've chosen to position. Quite niche, quite focused, uh, quite highly skilled, probably some of them maybe a thought leader. Some of them maybe use social media to be able to tell people what they thought, but they were very, very clear what it was. So that's just one way that the, you can, can start positioning yourselves. If you don't position yourselves, um, this is what happens. You become, uh, here, so here's the danger of what I call being a total people pleaser, meaning, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the marketing prostitute that just does anything for everyone. So uh, let me tell you the, the, the results of it. And some of these kind of may resonate. So firstly, here's what we call the seven deadly, deadly sins. Uh, your sales efforts are all over the place. So you're not as focused on who really needs your, your product or service. Because after all, you think everyone needs it. So it's very, very so you know, you're, you're out there trying to go through the four million people white pages or yellow pages. Uh, your sales pitch. So we actually, when you get in front of part of these four million people, your sales pitch is very disjointed as you need to keep changing the benefits for every new customer. You know, ultimately, your product or service solves a problem. But because you're talking to four million people, you're solving a lot of problems 
that you're probably not equipped to solve. Uh, no one understands what your company stands for any longer as you appear so frenetic. And the frenetic I've got there with my little energizer bunnies, you know, keeps going and going and going, you know. So there's my little bunnies like that, you know, you're just, you're just going, you're, you're working hard, you're doing lots of things, but you're probably not getting much traction. Uh, internal capability and skills are built up over time around a unique position. So, you know, we talked about the surgeon, we talked about the lawyer, we talked about the accountant in our little quiz. I imagine over time they're quite focused in a core area and they've practiced it over and over and over again and they've got very good at it. You don't do that, you don't become very good at anything if you're taking all sorts of um, positions everywhere. Uh, you give off a sense of desperation. You know, it's kind of like, here's my business card, how many people can I give it to? And people can actually sense that when they're actually working with you. Uh, you get burnt out because you're so busy. You're like the bunnies. You're just, you know, just really, really busy doing stuff that's not totally productive at all. And, you know, worse still, it ultimately slows down the growth of your business because you're just so busy being everything to everyone, you're not actually um, positioning it so, because uh, you're doing all the above stuff, and it makes it damn hard. So I don't know whether some of those resonate with you, or whether maybe one or two resonate with you, but if even, even one resonates with you, you've probably got a positioning problem. Okay, so what happens when you position your... Now, I like, don't you like this? And he's a Kiwi bunny because he's wearing jandals. I couldn't resist that one. So, you know, I want the Kiwi bunny wearing jandals. I want us to feel like a little bit laid back. And that's kind of what happens when we do get it right. We don't, it's easier to find customers because you're focused on a particular target market um, who have a particular issue. So it's a lot, lot easier to find where those people are. Uh, it's easier to convince potential customers uh, to become loyal customers. So um, they get that you're smart and they know your stuff. So it's, and it's easier for them to refer you as well. Uh, your expertise in the industry grows, which in turn attracts more customers your way. So you become like a magnet, okay? And you've got a nice life because you're doing actually less sales. More sales are coming to you rather than you actually having to go out there and uh, get those. So you can be kind of like a little lazy, lazy bunny. Well, not a lazy bunny, but a relaxed bunny rather than an energizer bunny. Okay, so how the hell do you go and do it? It's not that hard to be honest, guys. It's really not that hard. You've just got to take a position and you've got to be committed to that. So in these examples, I'm going to talk to you about different positions that some of our clients or some of big brands have actually taken. So think about this in terms of, of you and what position that you're going to be taking. Uh, think about what you enjoy doing, what interests you, and you know what you're good at. One of the things are when you have all that combo together, you get very energised. Not so energised that you're an energised bunny going round and round, uh, but um, you become very, um, you know, you think smarter, you act quicker, and you achieve a hell of a lot more. So, uh, and all the things, you know, you take things on with energy and gusto, and you're enthusiastic. And that enthusiasm is incredibly infectious when you start selling and working with people that you actually want to. So that's kind of like a first starting point. Don't do stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't actually cross those. Um, think about your competitors uh, and where they focus their attention and energy. So we've all got competitors. Sometimes apathy may be a competitor, guys. Uh, the whole thing about competitors is you've got to know who they are better than you know your mother-in-law. So if you don't, that might be a first starting point. So let me give you an example of that. We have a, um, a client that does a lot of work with farms. So they produce products, uh, drenching products for sheep and goats. So their ultimate customer is going to be, well, I guess sheep and goats, but it's farm, you know, farmers on their farmland, right? 
highly, highly competitive. Big, big, big corporates in that, in that field. So when we actually sat down and did some work with them and we said, well, how can we be, di be different? How can we position ourselves quite differently? And one of the ways that we did that was that we said, well, we're not going to go to direct to farmers because everyone else is doing that. We're going to actually work with large animal vets who in turn then work with farmers. So pretty brave, you know, brave move because believe me, no large fam, you know, large animal vets <laughs> initially really wanted to work with us. You know, but we just kept hammering away, hammering away at it. We now have 90% of large animal work vets working with us. Uh, no one of our competitors have been able to get close to that. What has it done for us? Well, immediately our client calls halved because we didn't have, there's not that, you know, there's a hell of a lot more farmers than there are vets. Uh, secondly, um, we got a lot of kudos because we're now working with people that in the farming community are thought leaders. And so we've been able to bridge some of those really cool relationships with them. And in turn, they've been able to give us some of our feedback about our product and how to improve it. And that has given us a very, very different position in the market that was otherwise we wouldn't have been able to actually influence because we would have just been the guy on the end battling away, talking with farmers, with companies that had a hell of a lot more budgets than what we did. Uh, think what sets you apart from your competitors. And by this, what I mean is, why are people saying yes to your competitors and no to you? One of um, the case studies um, that I was lucky enough actually to mark the New Zealand, be a judge on the New Zealand Marketing Awards. Um, so one of the case studies that came to mind here, and I'm going to use it because I know we've all had a relationship with it at some, at some time in our lives, is McDonald's. So McDonald's has probably more competitors than what anyone in the room kind of has on a daily basis, whether it's you know, Burger King, um, whether it's you know, Burger Fuel, whether it's my local fish and chip guy, whatever it is, or just people that don't see it as, a, as an option for them. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, McDonald's did when they reviewed their competitors is that McDonald's, a lot of the feedback was amongst its competitors is McDonald's hadn't changed in 40 years. That's what customers were saying. It was like, wow, 40 years, that's a pretty significant time to actually stand still in something that's low margin, fast moving, and uh, huge, huge um, overheads based on that. So uh, one of the things that they did around that was that there was a trend also happening out there that people were wanting um, to have healthy, there were you know, healthier options, um, they were wanting to not be in the fury of the fast and furious checkout where I was being served within three minutes, otherwise a siren was going off and, and so forth. So all that McDonald's launched uh, in the market, and some of you may have seen it, creates your own taste, where you can actually go along, design your own burger digitally, and then it gets delivered to your table. So something that um, hadn't been in the market before, none of the competitors had it, they were really, really clear of a trend that was starting to happen. Um, and, you know, last year they announced that they had a 19% net, net profit, pro, profit growth in New Zealand. So it's working really well. It's only been rolled out to 50% of, the, of their franchises because of the, you know, it's a huge <coughs> investment. Um, but that's actually saying, how can we get our leap on our competitors and maybe actually giving a few more customers that we may have lost? Uh, think about what group of customers are not being looked well, are not being uh, well looked after in your area of business. So, what are the things that aren't being actually done well? Uh, Coke Zero guys was all built on the response um, to diet drinks not appealing to men. So things like um, um, you know diet Coke and all that kind of thing was very very much appealing to to, to women. Whereas Coke Zero was an attempt to actually appeal to men with huge success. Uh, so that was a group that wasn't being looked after. Nivea for men. You know, Nivea realised that, you know, you know, I don't know whether I was quite 
aware of the trend, but you know, the whole glamming of men, you know, being very interested in skin care and what they looked like and all those kind of things. Within 20 to 35 year old um, young males, Nivea won that market. Others that came along didn't get the, quite the market share that Nivea was able to. And all of that is just being based on looking at a group of customers who aren't being looked after. You know, there was Diet Coke in the market, there was Nivea in the market, but they actually tailor that. And there'll be those opportunities for you. Uh, think about any trends that may be able to happen in an industry that no one seems to be championing. You know, look, I think about the big, you know, I kind of, I can't help but think about, you know, the Kodaks of this world that, you know, consistently still bought out film when they didn't actually realise that our needs uh, were actually rapidly changing as to how we wanted to, you know, uh, store and shape our memories. You know, they should have been in the phone business. And then there was Nokia that was in the phone business that absolutely saw Apple and Android wipe out their whole stocks of um, hardware. Why? Because they actually didn't realise that hardware and software were still things that we were still wanting. They weren't mutually exclusive from, from each other. You know, probably the ones, the stories, the success stories that who have really, really taken that on well and I think about it, and I'll use ones that we probably all know, are things like Airbnb and Uber that have gone in and actually changed the whole industry. You know, changed and thought about the trends. And they actually really realised that you was, all those companies did was provide a platform for you to either order a taxi or book accommodation. They're just the middleman. You know, and look how well they've done and look how well they've actually shaped up their industries based on a trend that they knew digitally you know, and that's all we're here for. Um, you, the consumer, wanted to connect to accommodation. You, the consumer, wanted to connect to a taxi online. And they just built that to be able to enable that to happen. Those are big, that's big stuff to get our head around. But there'll be those nuggets in there that you need to be ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve. You know, Kodak's still sitting there going, oh my God, what happened? And I think there's some taxi companies that are saying the same thing. So this is about you, and, and every industry will have its own norms and will have its own trends. So, um, look, I've just got here some um, other favourite positions here. Look, these guys aren't... Um, there's lots of different positions you, you can take. We've talked a little bit about distribution, we've talked a little bit about niche, but, you know, here's some other things. You know, look here, cheap and cheerful in the warehouse doing notoriously well, you know, selling cheap crap on a consistent basis. Fabulous, you know, but there was a gap in the market for that and they're doing well. You know, Trillise Cooper here that has used digital really, really well when it was always thought we couldn't sell high-end um, products uh, over, you know, um, through, through, through digital. So you've got a whole different, um, and then you, of course you've got, you know, in New Zealand that kind of champions the whole lot there. So those are just some examples of some positions that companies have taken, just like you can. So if I had your company and your logo down here, what, would you, what position would you actually say? I think is the thing that, because you've got to actually, when you hear about what Rebecca and Jamie are going to say, you've got to think, well, what position am I going to take based on what I'm going to say. So that's why it's important to get some of this right. Um, look, so I've got here, so what position in this crowd, so book and what, so that's just about our booking system. Um, so please don't, don't forget that, um, because we can actually work out what's your position in the, if you don't already have it, if you haven't already got it, got it worked out. Um, and lastly, I've just got this down here. It's called, it's a, oh, sorry, Mr. Video Man. Uh, that, that's time I've, I've got to finish, hey? Uh, so this is our free ebook. It's worth $59.95. Please download it. It's free, full your boots. Lots of articles um, about the subject um, that are going, that's going to help you as well. So please um, take advantage of that offer. So, uh, with that, guys, we're going to have questions at the end, so just hold, because I want to, because we've got so much good information. Can't stop now. Um, thank you for your time, um, and I'm going to introduce Rebecca.
I'm Rebecca Caro, and I run Creative Agency Secrets, and I've had to change my introduction because I now feel very challenged and defensive about my positioning. <laughs> <laughs> We're a marketing agency that works with smaller brands and owner-managed businesses, and our positioning is on the front of our brochure. It says, we help business owners solve the problem of chasing new customers. And our positioning uses video. You can't hear this, but this is a video brochure called a Pitch Pack. So if anyone's interested, it's pitchpack.co.nz. We actually run it and supply them. But just a little point of difference way of talking about what we do that's slightly different from what you guys do. Now, today I want to talk about local marketing because despite all indications to the contrary, local is more important than ever. And by local, I don't just mean your city, your suburb, this country. I have a client who does local marketing to the English-speaking world. So these are eight tips that you can use. I will be going through them fast. I will share my slides on SlideShare, and of course, you'll have the video afterwards. So if more explanation is needed, just make a note of it and come ask. I don't want to scare, but digital transformation is very real and it is definitely impacting your business. If you are not aware of it, you need to be because it has already come. It is already affecting all of us and by golly, it matters. The degree to which it matters will vary depending on the business that you are in. So I like to see two sides of a coin. It's both a threat and a promise. And despite all indications to the contrary, and you can tell from my accent that I'm not from around here, I have had to learn a lot about how New Zealanders like to do business. <laughs> and you do business differently from the way that I have done business in the UK and Europe and in the US. And one of the things you all say is, word of mouth. Now, I'm not decrying word of mouth because a lot of you are here because of word of mouth. I've spoken to two people just in breakfast outside who said, oh, I got the invite and I forwarded it on to so-and-so and, -so and here, here he or she is. There's nothing wrong with word of mouth, but it cannot be your only strategy. So here are some of the expectations that are definitely hitting your business. This is what people who buy from you are expecting. They expect to be able to contact you how they want to, not how you want to. Many of them don't want a one-size-fits-all. They do want to customise their burger, as Rosina described. New marketplaces particularly are really, really important. Those middlemen that Rosina talked about that sit between the buyer and the seller. We just took a client onto Amazon.com seller marketplace and Amazon Europe seller marketplace. They have one product that has skyrocketed. They are up about 4,000% year on year just on one product and it's a $20 mirror, just saying. These are all opportunities that you absolutely have to test out for yourself. I'm not promising that you will get those results, but you need to know what the opportunity is and whether it's relevant or valid for you. This is what I want to run through. These are all tactics, so let's be completely clear. My business does execution marketing. Rosina will set your strategy and your positioning. We help you do the stuff. Where you do the stuff, whether it's digital, online, offline, direct mail, telephone sales, I don't mind. We're, um, we are uh, neutral officially on that because what suits you may not suit the next person. But these are all tactics that you should consider. Let's start with a really straightforward one. Who's registered on Google My Business? Okay, so you see the little pretty picture on the right. I always use myself as the example because if we're not doing it right, then how can I expect you to do it right? If you write creative agency secrets into Google, you see this little picture on the right-hand side. And this is four aspects of my business that Google can help you with. Words, pictures, video, and maps. You can control how Google represents your business. Now, if you're in a crowded marketplace, like we have a client who is in kitchen fitting, kitchen cabinets to be specific, there's lots of people who do that. You need to be able to stand out. And this is one way of standing out. Make sure your logo's up, up there. Make sure the map is accurate. It's unbelievable the number of maps that are not correctly representing where a business is. Your opening hours are there and that you've got reviews for your business. 
On the left hand side is the main natural search listing. You've got a headline and you've got six subcategories. You can influence how Google represents those, what little words are under the subheadings, and the order in which they are displayed. It's in what used to be called um, Google Webmaster Tools and is now called Google Search Console. And if you don't know how to do it, uh, we've got a free ebook. The guys at the back who work for me, Jeremy and Conrado, give them your card and they'll email you a link so you can download a how to do that. Get yourself registered. It's absolutely free. Go to business.google.com. And what Google does is it sends you a postcard through the post to verify your actual address. This is important. They do want to know that you're a real business with a physical location. These cards get lost in the post quite frequently. It is very well worthwhile persisting. And it can take three or four weeks for the card to arrive because they send it from America. Get verified. That's when you receive the card and you have a six digit code that says you are who you say you are. But then, Connect up all the other bits that Google does, the video, the analytics, the insights, if you advertise through AdWords. Let's key in on Google Plus these days, but make sure that if you have a profile for your business and all those other places, you tell Google, hey, we're all the same. How many of you have multi-site locations? Good. Definitely get every single site registered so that it's very clear that again, you are the same business. We moved offices at the turn of the year, and it was a little bit of a palaver, but it was really important that we took the reviews that we had got at our previous address, which was in K Road, flipped over to our new address, which is in France Street. So on the previous slide, you'll see it said we only had one review. We actually had another four, and we persuaded Google to merge the two accounts so that our reviews carried over. Now, if you're a multi-site, it may be important to your customers to know what people have said about your operation in Hamilton, and that what they say about Hamilton is not applicable to Tauranga. So just consider that when you're doing your listings. Keywords continue to be important, and understanding them is really, really key to the essence of your business. I recommend using more than one source of keywords. Let's be completely clear here. Google supports its own objectives. Its objective is to sell you advertising, and there is nothing wrong with that. But an independent keyword tool can be beneficial to verify and cross-check against what Google's recommended. So here are some tools that you can use. The SBI apps is a paid one, which we use. So if you work with us, you get access to that. But Moz is there. Word Tracker is there. And I will put these slides on SlideShare so you don't have to scribble down all the URLs. Um, but learn how to research keywords. And Moz is a very, very good resource. In fact, I've got a few other resources in this show that you can just go and read afterwards that, without being patronizing, carefully explains what you need to do and how to do it. Going back to local, make sure you mention where you are. If it really matters that you're in Eden Terrace, say it, you know, which suburb, which state, which county, whatever. The metadata in every place where your brand is represented, and that could be on Facebook, obviously it's on your website, but it could also be on Google My Business, it can also be in the yellow pages. These are not to be ignored, and you do need to be consistent and to keep the same information appearing. Directory listings, those of us with grey hair will remember nice big fat printed directories that these are all the solicitors in the country and these are all of the registered plumbers and things like that. These things still exist. In fact, there are more of them than ever. And it is important that you get your business listed in the ones that are relevant for your trade or practice. I like to recommend that you have two versions of your listing a one sentence, which is a bit like mine, we help business owners solve the problem of finding new customers, and then maybe a paragraph that amplifies a little further. Um, and then save that, because then you can copy and paste it, obviously. Yellow, I'm sorry, I've got some Australian references in there, because some of you, I'm sure, are trading in Australia as well. Um, yellow pages is still important. If you find my listing in yellow pages, and obviously, you know, you can put your website into yellow pages and it sends customers straight through to your website. I have a landing page on my website, which is forward slash yellow, so that people who come to us from yellow, A, it's easy for me to isolate them and identify them. But secondly, on that page, I make it easy for them. 
I know if you've come to us from Yellow Pages, I've got a pretty good idea of what you are looking for. So going to my home page, which might have stuff about today on it, I think it does at the moment, may not be what you are looking for right now. So I use the page, the landing page, as a signpost. So I can quickly direct you to the part of my website that hopefully is relevant for what you're looking for. And it also acknowledges the fact that you've come from Yellow Pages. So I look intelligent. I always like to look intelligent. Bright Local is a very good service. It's global. And their citation service, they specialise in finding local directory listings. Now, if I was to ask you, if we had a lot more time, what directories you know, you, we will together come up with four or five, including Localist, including things like Neighbourly. There are over 30 for New Zealand. I hadn't heard of most of them. Um, so it's worth paying a small sum to them, and they will go and do some of the listings for you and keep them up to date. And uh, yeah, so Yelp, if you're a physical location where you want people to come to, Yelp is a very, my husband is a mad Yelp user. I, you know, I didn't realize this until I went on holiday with him recently and he was using it in Buenos Aires, which not to show off about where we went on holiday, but more the fact that it was global. And I was really interested that he trusted that as a source of tourist information. When you do a Google search, you write a two or three word phrase into Google and it comes up with search results. Google will email you everything new for that result, that search, if you want, and it's called Google Alerts. So your brand, the names of your key operators, your competitors, new business opportunities, you can set up a search string in Google Alerts and opt to receive an email. Now, some of us work in very time sensitive um, kind of news businesses. You might have that alert sent as it happens. Or you might just say, no, send me a weekly summary. I don't need to have this every single minute of the day. But you can then set up some really, really useful insight. And you can limit it to New Zealand. You can limit it to academic journals. You can limit it to video only. You can limit it to news only. You know, there's a lot of ways of setting up your advanced search. Um, we use it for some clients to put comments. So if something comes up on Herald or on Stuff, you can log in and give a point of view and say, I work for this company and either I agree or disagree. And it's a very nice way of representing your expertise. Some people use it as a way of contacting prospects. There are blogs that I have commented on years ago, and I've been blogging since 2006, that still bring incoming traffic to our website. And Obviously, you can then use that to build a mailing list. And a mailing list is probably one of your best assets as a business. If you do not know how to use search operators inside Google, go and take a tutorial. This is how you get the Google Alerts to send you valid and relevant information and not the wrong sort of information. Because we've all done that. We've all become very expert at scanning through Google and thinking, yeah, that's right, no, that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. This will help you to further refine and filter the search string. And it's a really, really important skill. Who's a member of a business association? Here in Auckland. Uh, everybody who pays rates is automatically a member of your local business association. And many business associations will allow people to be members even if you're not a local rate payer. So if you particularly feel that the Grey Limb Business Association or Teatro or whatever is, is important for you. Some are more active than others, but they're absolutely super, super organisations and great ways for networking. I speak, I gave this talk to the Grey Lynn one and I'm going to do it in Teas two later on next month. Um, you can do promotions to them if you need, um, if your business runs in that sort of way. And again, build your mailing list. Can you tell I'm a direct marketer? <laughs> the mailing lists are really, really important. If you haven't got one, please get one. Um, definitely look at business associations and networking groups. There are lots of very diverse groups. A lot of the ones that I have joined, I have found in two principal ways. One is through LinkedIn, or people telling me about them or bringing a friend along. The other is I found through meetup.com. So when I first moved to New Zealand, we lived in Dunedin, and then we moved to Auckland, and obviously very, very different ecosystems for business. And we didn't 
We initially used it for social purposes rather than business, but meetup.com is absolutely brilliant. And in fact, I've used it successfully for um, a client who is a lady who is a stand-up comedian who was going to do a comedy festival in Adelaide. Very good way to find locals quickly, and she knew exactly who her target demographic was. Before she got there, she joined these meetups of young mums and helpful singles and people who like to go out and um, do things together. And then when she got to Adelaide ahead of time, she went to the group so they'd all met her, and then she was able to explain she was in town because she was the stand-up comedian. So it was a really neat way with a very low budget of getting in front of audiences. Does anyone know the cards and the pocket trick? You notice I've got two. So we meet the business card exchange. You've all done that. In my right pocket, I put the cards of the people that I know I want to follow up with. In my left pocket, I put the others. So I know where to spend my time the next morning on what, which people I really, really want to follow up with. This is very Kiwi, but it's very human. We all need to know who's worthy of our trust. And testimonials is a good way of doing it. Here are some straightforward tips. Make sure there is an obvious place on the website where people can find testimonials. And if you are confident, please date them with the most recent one at the top of the page. It's a very good look to have a very, very, very long page of testimonials that appear to come at regular intervals. I said the word appear carefully there. You know, I'm a marketer. If you get a testimonial, try and again do a short and long version. It's a bit like listing your business. So there's a sound bite, and that can go on the testimonials page. But quite often, people give really interesting insight in a slightly longer few sentences. And then we make that into a blog post. So you can have a category on your news blog that's called testimonials or references or whatever the right word is for your business. And you can obviously then put it there as well. More than that, you can also link out to your client's website. And you would be astonished if you don't already follow your own analytics, how many of these linkages genuinely, people genuinely follow them to see who they are. So you're sending traffic to your client's business as well as them potentially sending traffic to you. The most important bit for this is the penultimate one. Have a business process that happens regularly to get you testimonials. If you're in B2B, it might be that part of raising the final invoice for a job is about getting a testimonial. Um, it might be that it's just something that comes up in your marketing agenda once every quarter. I, I don't know your business, but you can work out what works for you and then make damn sure it happens. And then ask for testimonials. So we, the Google My Business page has a little thing that says uh, reviews, but let's call it testimonials. The regrettable thing about it and the very Google thing about it is you have to have a Gmail address in order to leave a review. I know, and you can probably think of them, there are clients that you have who you think, that is in the too hard basket, they're never going to do that. Don't worry. So I have a parallel process. For those where I'm reasonably certain that they won't have any problems with that, I direct them there. And of course, there's nothing to stop me copying and pasting that review onto my website as well. The other nice thing about Google reviews is you can reply to it and respond so that it, there's a little bit of dialogue. On LinkedIn, for all of us, please ask for recommendations, not endorsements. Endorsements is the click that says, do you want to endorse Rebecca for, and I have seen pole dancing suggested, <laughs> someone with a good sense of humor. Those only show up as tiny, tiny little sub postage stamp size clicks on your profile page, and they really have very little value. A recommendation is real words written by a real person. Just for reassurance, LinkedIn emails that to you to approve before it gets published. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of potential dialogue there. Local advertising. Don't forget, the traditional methods work. Really good for both brand building and for products and service promotions. Um, here's just a list of appropriate places where you might choose to advertise, and this was a... Um, a client that we did uh, a little bit of work on. 
we, this, was, this was just something that Facebook came up with, but it basically said, um, you can get 90,000 people who are within four miles of your physical location. Well, that wasn't actually a great attraction for this business, but you know, for some people that might be lovely. Facebook is notoriously complicated and they are so-and-sos at changing the rules and making things difficult. Here is a resource for you to tutor yourself. It's a website and a podcast. I commend it to you. Um, I've linked to a few key episodes here, um, which an example for, fit, for a fitness studio, an example for financial services. It's really, really worthwhile getting to grips with this or finding someone who can do it for you. Did any of you see these adverts on Facebook? Yep, yeah, a couple. This is advertising this event. We went onto Facebook because although it's very nice to have three businesses, we can also advertise to people who don't yet know us. We advertise people who match behaviors. People who are admins for Facebook pages for business are highly likely to be business owners or business decision makers. We also then did people who are just in the region. And surprisingly, the vast majority were looking on their mobile newsfeed. People were not using their desktops. And that was just some cute little insights of real people who responded to those adverts about this event. Press relations locally, really, really worthwhile looking at, particularly if you happen to know some of the New Zealand Herald columnists. So got a nice article from Graham McGregor recently. Uh, I sent him the article. He was kind enough to print it and credit me. Um, local listings, this event was on Finder. It was on the Herald event guide. And lastly, ask for those referrals. Really, really worthwhile doing. And do it when people are actually on the point of rejecting you. They feel a little bit guilty about saying, really sorry, we're not going to be working with you. And you say, that's absolutely fine. Would you be kind enough to introduce us to someone who might want to work with us? And believe me, guilt is a wonderful motivator. My name's Jamie. I'm from a company called Pure Productions. And I, essentially, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I've been making films for about 20 years. I started out in the UK um, making TV shows and documentaries and reality shows and Top of the Pops and all these different things. About 15 years ago I moved to New Zealand and when I came here I thought, my God, this place is small. <laughs> which I thought this is great because I've got an opportunity to use my skills and develop a business which is different and a production company which is different. So I set out to uh, build Pure as a production company that offered a a quality of, of work and a quality of service without this huge cost that was around video then. Fifteen years later, video has changed immensely and now video is affordable to most businesses and most people in some way. So what I want to talk to you about today is how you can use video online and how a few simple tips and pointers that if you're going to use it online, things that you need to look out for and watch and be aware of so, so that you maximise it. So what I want to first start off first of all is just find out who's actually used video in the online space recently for their business. Who's had great success with it? Who has not used it and has an issue with using it? Good. I might as well just finish now then. You get it, huh? Everybody gets video works. We don't need to talk about that. So what I'll do, I've got to click through this laptop a little bit, but I'll just show you a quick video about my company so you get an idea of what we do and what things look like. Um, We're a boutique production company producing the kind of work big film shops would gladly put their name to, but without the excess. We work a little differently. As a team of experts, we create beautiful images to tell compelling stories that evoke emotion and drive a response. Let's talk to some of those 
Well, no one will work quite like us to understand your company. This is so tasty. Having been down to Blue Hill and seeing how the farm is... Because we're not suppliers, we're partners, and we're passionate about creating results. From captivating TV commercials and powerful online video content, to engaging corporate communications. We're proud of the work we deliver. Advertising brands in exciting new ways. Engaging, training, and motivating the staff of some of the country's largest companies and doing things a little bit differently. So in terms of video, in terms of a, a marketing sense, I like to compare video to like the superman of the, of the marketing world because it's got these superpowers. And if you understand the superpowers that video has, you can maximise it when you do use it. So I'm going to really quickly run through these. I hope you can keep up. I've got a lot I want to share with you and say um, and stuff I want to show you, so I will be quite quick. So video is the king of content. Video is the king of content because it uses visual images, it uses audio, it uses text, it uses mood, it uses all of these things which uh, manipulate and shape the way we feel about something and the way we think about something. Far more than, say, text, which I just demonstrated then. You watch that video. If I talked to you about all that stuff, it would have taken far longer. Number two, SEO. So here's something that people miss when it comes to video. If you have a website, out there on Google, there's five billion other web pages that Google has to troll through before they find your content or your tech site. There's not so much video. So if you're using video and it's properly, you've got proper keywords around it and you've worked it out properly, you're beating all of those tech sites that you've got up there. So video is 53 times more likely to appear on Google's first page. That's not 53%, that's 53 times more likely to appear on Google's first page than a text page. So that's pretty powerful if you create the correct keywords around your video, which is what a lot of people miss. I love the way you're writing. This is really good. <laughs> oh, I'm shooting my phone on a video. <laughs> there you go, there's gonna be a video, so there we go. No, it's good, it's good, it shows that you're getting it. Okay, number three. Same, as, same, same class as SEO, and that's YouTube. So in 2006, I think November, um, Google bought YouTube for $1.65 billion. What does that mean to us that, that are advertising and trying to market our business and brands? It means that they're using the same data. Everything that you do on Google and YouTube, they share everything, so it's, it's interlinked. So if you, cook, if you search for something on, on Google, you're going to have YouTube videos pop up, pages pop up. So video's in the same search engine, which is great to, great to be able to maximise. Number four, it's the master format. Who's used video and gone, shit, that's expensive? No, you haven't worked with me yet then. <laughs> no. <laughs> Here's the thing about master format. What I mean about that is, is it may be an expense to produce that first video, more so than, produ than pr producing, say, a text document or a still image. But from that video, you can pull still images for Pinterest or Facebook. You can, you can pull the audio from it to create podcasts or soundtracks. Later down the road, you can recut it and repurpose it. So if you create one video, it can have many uses. That's what I mean about master format. Number five, immediacy. Who knows what immediacy means? Good. 
<laughs> immediacy, my view of immediacy is, is humans, we love to watch things happen. So 20 years ago, when I first started out, I started working out on reality TV shows. And everyone said, these aren't going to, they'd never take off. It's a fad. It's not going to work. Shit, we're still watching them more than ever because humans just love to watch things play out. Yeah? And that's the beauty of video is, is, is right now it's happening here with this camera at the back, immediacy. We can just watch things happen. And that's an important point to note down the track. If you are looking to produce video and you're thinking of budget, if you can create something that just happens and you capture it on camera, you've saved yourself production cost of setting things up. And we use that a lot in, with, with certain clients in setting up PR stunts and then filming them, releasing them on social media. It's a very cheap way of doing things, but very watchable. So one of the other superpowers. Number six, emotional connection. This is the bit that I love because it's the most powerful. As a filmmaker, the most important point of any piece of content that you make is the moment it ends. How do you feel at the end of it? Because how you feel will direct what's your next action. Yeah? So if you create an emotion, evoke an emotion, you can direct a response. That might be to click to go to your website, it might be click to buy now, it might be to phone a number, it might be, it might be that you feel energised from it, it might be that you feel worried about something, but that's very powerful that other forms of marketing can't achieve the same way as video. Number seven, retention. There's a lot of statistics around retention which I've forgotten because I've read them. Everyone, did anyone get that one or yet? Yeah. Whereas if I'd watch a video on it, I'd probably get it. So the reason that video is so retentive, or we retain video so well, is that it's visual, it's auditory, and it's kinesthetic which we, we, when we watch video, we pick up on body language, we pick up on the tones, we pick up on facial movements, and that aids in our retaining the information. It's something like 73% more likely that you'll, you'll retain the information from a video than you will from a text document. I, I made that up, but... <laughs> Good bit of video, so. It's, yeah. Interactivity. <laughs> so there's a number of things around inter interactivity that is exciting because it's moving quickly, this side of things. But interactivity at the moment, what's exciting for, for new businesses using video or people using video is the things of liking, sharing. On, on Facebook, for example, you can create a video that can go anywhere in the world. It can be shared anywhere. There's not many other forms of marketing that you can use in that manner and have that, uh, that reach without boundaries. The other thing, for example, in YouTube, being able to put annotations and things within your video that can, people can click on. Where technology is going is highly personalised video. So I'm working with a company at the moment that we're developing personalised videos that you can, a video will be sent to you, you'll click on it and it will talk to you with your name and it will know where you live. So it's, it's, that's huge in terms, if you think of insurance companies onboarding customers, they can collect information and talk to you as if that's just wiped out a whole call center. Very powerful personalized video for some uses. So those are the superpowers of video that you need to understand if you're going to use video efficiently and understand why it works so well. So here's a case study of a client of ours, and I picked this one because video works really well if you're selling products online for obvious reasons. If you watch a video and you can click buy right next to it, it's one step. So this, this is a, a company that's recently formed. It's called Best Beauty Box. And what they do is they do subscription beauty boxes. Sounds, when I first heard it, I was like, okay, yeah, it's a subscription box. But they've marketed really well, and they're using a lot of video. So I'm going to play this first one so you sort of get an idea. What they're using is, is, is a number of forms of video. First of all, they're using vloggers. So they get people that, that they pay to blog, video blogs, about their product and then release those on YouTube. and release. So it hits not only their audience, but it hits the vlogger's audience as well. So if I've got 4 million followers on YouTube and I vlog about a product, I'm going to get paid a lot of money to do that. So that's what they're using. They're also using consumer-driven content. So they'll run through their Facebook channel prizes. If you upload a video of you opening a box, you might win a, bu a box next month. So they get all this free content. And it's all video based. So I'll show you the one from JJ is, a, is one of their vloggers. Whoops. Um, where's my mouse? That they pay monthly to 
release social media videos. If this all plays. And they're quite funny. Which is their positioning, by the way. Sorry about this clicking. It's the one downside of video. So you sort of get the idea, right? It's a person blogging about a product. This isn't on Beauty Box's Facebook site. This is on her site. And she's got 100,000 people liking, following this. So a huge way of leveraging somebody else's audience online. So that's, that's one thing that they, they, uh, they use to release this product. So they, they've been using this as a, as a form of marketing for a, a certain period of time. It's been really effective for them. But where they're, what they're finding in market research, what they were finding, is people didn't really understand the concept. They thought you had to sign up for a month. They, sort of, they, thought, that they, sorry, they thought that you had to sign up for a period of time and that there was only one or two boxes and they never changed and you were locked into this thing. Tied. So what they decided to do was create some content that they could market the concept of what they do and use it as a sort of hero video that they pushed out to everything. It's like the home page of their website, which essentially a lot of video is, a home page for your website. So we created, we came up with a concept for them that uh, was engaging, it was comical, um, but it explained what the product really was and how it worked. And they promoted this through YouTube, which in the last month, they released a month ago, they've got 65,000 views. Um, that's 200, that, sorry, that's 2,000 and something views a day. If you imagine they, they convert a small percentage of those views to sales, it's not bad when you, if I tell you how much they paid for the video. It's a pretty good deal they've got. Plus that they're using it on their Facebook page, which I haven't put the stats up there. Um, and they're, they're using it on demand. So if you go to TVNZ online, their ads popping up there as well. So they're getting massive reach from what is actually a pretty small spend compared to what you'd have to do five years ago through TV. So we created this piece of content for them, and I'll tell you why we designed it the way we did. Everything's about, online, you've got to have a hook in the first 10 minutes, in the first five seconds, ideally, and you've got to have your logo up there pretty quickly as well. But how do you do that and still make it interesting? So we created, if it works, Hi, hi. I'm Sarah from Best Beauty Box Ever. That's right, Best Beauty Box Ever. Never heard of us? Well, you have now. Da -da -da -da. So what exactly is the Best Beauty Box Ever? Well, it's a box. Not that kind of box. This kind of box. In fact, our beauty boxes come in all beautiful, unique shapes and sizes just like us women. We release a new box with a new theme every month. But you don't just get these wonderful boxes. Inside, they are jam-packed with the latest beauty products. Products for your nails, your eyes, your skin, even your grandmother-in-law. So you might be thinking, what exactly do I get in one of these beauty boxes? Well, in our beauty boxes, you'll find only the world's finest brands. But do you get teeny tiny little samples and sachets of products that aren't even available here? No! You get full-size products chosen especially for you, like these, and these, and these, ooh, and these, and these. What's more, they're all colours and products you can get right here in New Zealand. So, when you need to repurchase them from your favourite retailer, you can. So, what's the catch? What's the monthly subscription fee to get your hands on a beauty box? There isn't one. There is no monthly subscription fee. Which means you're free to go online at any time and order the latest beauty box. And does it cost the US? No. <laughs> 
And did we mention every month we release a new box? So you'll have good reason to pamper yourself and everyone you know. And we think that deserves a party. So if you noticed in that video, in the first shot, it's obviously aimed at women. In the first shot, there's a little sketch about, it's a Diet Coke ad basically, I don't know if you guys remember that. It's got the, the good looking guy digging a hole outside and blah, blah, blah. And then it goes straight into... Hi everybody, this is my unboxing for... Within the first set, 10 seconds, it's then they introduce the name of the company and the brand. So that's very important. If you're using it, for example, on demand, you've only got five to 10 seconds before someone's got to click away. If they click, you pay for, in, for YouTube. If they don't click and they just watch the first five or 10 seconds, at least they've seen your brand. How much do you, would you pay to get a logo on a card, on a poster, in a magazine? So you can use that some ways in free. As long as you've got the name of your company or logo or brand up in the first five to 15 seconds, you're still going to get people to see it. So that's, that's a case study. Um, the next steps with them, what they're looking to do now is they want to develop a series of ads like that one we produce for them that they can release every month. Because this has honestly taken their business from, it was doing well, it's gone crazy for them because people get it. And it's just video and it doesn't cost a lot of money. In terms of ampli amplification, I think to get these 65 views, and she's probably got a similar amount on Facebook, she paid about $10,000. And I think for on demand, she probably would have paid probably twice that. But her sales have definitely paid off to the point now that she wants to develop a whole series. She doesn't want one video, she wants a whole series of them for the year. So. In knowing the superpowers, knowing there's a little example of how you can use video, how do you generate, how do you use video to generate leads and revenue? The first thing is how do you do it properly? How do you start? What are the things to think about? So here's, here's a few quick pointers. The first thing is what's your objective? A lot of people call me up and they want me to produce a video for them. I go, what do you want it to do? Ooh, make me more money. That's good, but what do you, how, that, how does that happen? Do you want to drive someone to your 0800 number? Do you want to drive someone to your website? Um, how do you want to, where do you want, what's the objective? What do you want people to do? The second one is who's your audience? It's good to know that bit. What's your positioning? It's the same thing. What's your positioning? Who's your audience? Who are you targeting with this video? The third thing is delivery platform. That's not like a high ab on a truck or anything. That's where, where are you going to put this video? You're going to use it on Facebook, you're going to use it on YouTube, you're going to use it on On Demand, you're going to use it in Snapchat. There's so many choices online now. There's three key ones in New Zealand. But what's your delivery platform? Because that will help you understand what type of video you need to make and in what way. What's the context? If content is king, content, context is queen. How are people going to consume this video? There's no point putting a 20 minute explain a video of how to take your product to bits on Facebook and expect it to have any cut through or work. People don't consume video in that way on Facebook, for example. Put it on YouTube with the right keywords could be very successful. So what's the context of how you're going to use this video? The fifth thing is what's the emotion? What do you want people to feel as they're watching this video to drive a reaction to it? Do you want them to feel worried that if they don't buy your product, they're going to miss out? Do you want them to feel Energize that they've got a chance to own this product? What's the emotion that you want them to have? Do you want them to be entertained? The sixth thing, what's the content? What have you actually got? Do you have still images? Do you already have ex existing video? Do you have something that's going to happen, like an event like this, that you can capture video around? So what's the content that you want to use and produce and put out there? So there's, there's six, six, how much longer have I got? <laughs> Done. Okay, so there's the six things. Da -da 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 -da. Got that? Next thing, make some content. Really easy. Get out there and do it. So how do you build brand? How do you build a brand that is loved? I'm going to go through this really quick. Start a YouTube channel. So, in terms of YouTube, do you know what a lot of people do? That out there they produce a video and then they give it to their SEO person or their web person to host on YouTube through their web person's account. So it means nothing. If I go to click on their click on whose video is this, it takes me through to some web company. I reckon 80% of people that are using video on YouTube are doing that. Facebook, if you're going to load a video to Facebook, don't put a link through YouTube, load the video itself to Facebook. And put titles on it because no one watches sound on Facebook. 
I'm losing the crowd here, I'm losing them. Number three, on demand, I've already talked about it before. Have your brand in the first five seconds. Number four, monitor the results. You can see the online world, you can see what's happening. Instantaneous, it's real time. Monitor the results and react to them. If your video is losing views at 33 seconds, have a look why and change it immediately. Make it work, you can react very quickly to things. The very last thing is add content to your YouTube channel or whatever you're doing frequently, frequently update it, use it as a communication tool. And the one thing to remember is give value. So give to your audience, give to your audience, give to your, and then ask something for them. So give, give them that they want to share your content with the people around them and really use the content that you give. So that's it, five tips online. The one thing to remember, it's more than just pushing video to a device. Video can be a gateway to a conversation with your customers now. They can talk to you through the videos that you put up. They can leave messages and all this thing. It's, very, it's a very uh, effective way of starting a communication with your customers. So that's it. Any more information? There's my details. Thank you very much for your time. I know that was very quick, but I hope you got something from it. Thank you.